It is emergency preparedness week throughout the province and some of you may have got that alert today through the federal government. So that nice little um, alert noise that makes the skin and the hair stand up. Um, and I believe the province is going to be doing theirs in the next couple of days with it too as well. So we're accustomed to that because you, we, we think it's a, an, an amber alert, right? Is that probably the first thing? And now local governments can use that alerting system to protect their citizens with um, an emergency situation so that now we can make a request to Victoria, we can script something, and then we can put it out to everybody that has a cell phone now. Because we're looking at how we can improve communications as best as we can, and that's one of the avenues that we have to offer. So I've been here for about three and a half years now. And uh, I previously came from Fort St. John, where I was with the fire department there for 12 years. And then prior to that, I was four and a half years in Tumbler Ridge as their fire chief. So <laughs> I originally came off of Vancouver Island. I'm a carpenter by trade, and then I got into the fire service and the next 30 years have written the path that I get the opportunity to speak with you folks tonight. So I've had uh, lots of training. I've had lots of good experiences and a lot of near misses and some, you know, just black holes, right? And so what we're going to talk to you about tonight is, um, is how you folks can be prepared, right? And recently we just had the, the fire down by the Doki sub. It was about two and a half kilometers on the outside of our fire protection area. And it started off as a, what seemed to be a small grass fire. With the winds prevailing, it took off, it got into the tree line, and away it went. And then the evening unfolded as it did. And we had to ask a bunch of residents to leave um, rather quickly, right? And that's why we're here tonight is to talk about how you can be prepared for when someone comes and knocks on your door. Right, because when you see a firefighter, or a search and rescue, or a police officer, they're going to be saying that there is an imminent threat to your um, safety and that you need to evacuate. And those are called tactical evacuations. So that means that something happens in a very short period of time and then you have to leave because we made the decision that you're in harm's way. So what do I do? Like, what do I, what do I pack up? What do I get? And, you know, one of the things is that when I evacuated Tumblr Ridge back in 2008, the comments that came back afterwards is that if the husband or the male was at home, it was the RV, the boat, the ATV, the guns, the dog, maybe the kids, okay? So, and then if the, the wife or the mother was at home, it was the kids, there was important documents, it was pictures, and it was uh, snacks for the kids in the car, right? So when we saw things moving out, we saw, you know, an RV, you know, with everything that's attached to it, converse to a SUV with the family in it. And so with those things is that it's, it's, it's how everybody prioritizes. And you guys have taken the opportunity to come here this evening to learn a little bit more how you can be properly prepared. So we're going to utilize uh, Prepare BC um, with their, um, with their protocols. So we were keeping within our provincial mandates. And then these pictures are from that Doki fire. So when I or originally arrived on scene, these are the pictures that I took. And then this is where this uh, air tanker was dropping on um, a spot fire. So a spot fire is when uh, amber cuts from the main and it lands wherever. And that's one of the things that when we were the fire department, we're deployed, that's what we're looking for is those spot fires so we can get on quickly. We had everything lined up so that the air tanker, instead of going on to the Doki Hill there, we came on and we hit that, uh, that uh, secondary fire and we were able to control it relatively quickly. So we had everything there lined up. And the unfortunate thing is, is that we can't guarantee that we have everything lined up, right? So as we move forward, um, what we're trying to teach you guys is that you want to know your hazards and you want to know what make your plan. And half of that is here tonight, you're working on making your plan, and then gathering the supplies, right? So we live in a very diverse area. We have lots of hazards, right? And it's one of those things is that we move through with this is that, you know, have you ever thought about what you're going to do in an emergency? 
my job is always risk management and I'm always looking at worst case scenarios. I don't, I don't see the sunshine too often because we have a drought, we haven't had any rain, uh, we're extremely dry, and finally we're starting to turn a little green, which is fantastic, because that green's gonna stop some of this stuff you know, as it progresses quickly. But one of the things is, have you ever thought about how you're going to prepare for an emergency? And so in this room, you guys obviously have taken the first step to think about how you're gonna prepare. Now we're gonna give you some tools put into that uh, backpack so that you're able to be prepared. <clears throat> what if, right, I didn't have electricity or water for three days or to two weeks? So some of the people that live in our area is now experiencing that drought conditions where they rely on a well. Now all of a sudden they have to bring water to their house, right? <clears throat> when we're talking about water, it's an essential. How many people in the room have enough water to get through two weeks? without it coming out the tap. Yeah, that's good, right? If it doesn't come out of the tap, doesn't come out of the well, right? Yeah, and that's good because I mean, my well has got a little sulfur to it, so I have a lot of bottled water, right? I'm not very environmentally friendly with that, but I know that I've got enough water to get by for a bit. Um, if you have to leave your home on short notice, um, you need to contact your family to get official information during an, informa um, an emergency. So when you guys are asked and the door knocks, is that we're either going to ask you to shelter in place because the immediate, immediate threat isn't there, right? It's safer for you to stay there. Um, or the weather or the hazard is going to dictate you stay at home, right? In 2016, this area was impacted by severe flooding. Right, you became a, a, an envelope being uh, stuck with no bridges. Right, that means nothing's coming in, no food, no water, no gas, all the things that we rely on, right? Um, electricity, high winds all the time, you know, trees on lines, we have the ability to lose power. So the people that were affected by that Doki fire, some people to the west were without power for several days, right? I believe you guys were out for power? So where the fire started, as you go around the corner and you're heading to Prince George, that little pocket has no cell service. So I had to go and move my vehicle to the uh, Basin Bridge uh, and set command there. Because I had a phone, right? I could communicate with everybody and I was able to work. Our radios work, but we have to work with the Unified Command with BBC Wildfire. And then I have to keep the district informed and the regional district and, and so on and so forth. So you need to have that, uh, that communication. And so when they put this slide together, they were saying that 54% uh, percent of the people say that they um, have an emergency response plan, right? But only 13% said that it's complete, right? Because when we're talking about certain things is that, you know, I know I have to be ready, right? Nowadays, for the last five years, the province has exploded with fires, right? Anybody that's not following any of that and all of a sudden says, oh, well, I didn't realize it was going to catch on fire and I didn't know there was fire and I didn't know it was going to grow so quick, right? It's naive because, you know, last year we were very fortunate, right? And, and hopefully this year, again, we have a moderate year. But if something does happen, we have to be properly prepared. And so what we're going to do tonight is going to be able to give you guys a bit of uh, a plan to get prepared. So... We're going to discuss a little bit about the hazards. We're going to talk a little bit about your plan and then how you're going to gather your supplies. You've got enough water for two weeks. Well, how do you do it? Do you have them in jugs? Do you have them in flats? Whatever the case may be. And then all of a sudden now you guys are thinking, okay, how can I start storing that stuff up? Where do I put it in my house? So on and so forth. Because again, that water, unless it's in a nice, cool, shaded area, right, without direct sunlight, right, it has to have those elements. Otherwise, there's still stuff in the water, right? When we pull it out of the tap, it still has some bacteria in it. And if it's in the sunshine, well, it's going to develop into something a little green, right? So we need to avoid that kind of stuff. So any questions about how we started this?
Everybody good with this kind of track that we're going to go try? Excellent. So everything is super interactive here, right? So if you have a question about something here or something that I say, please stop me and I can at least try to answer to the best of my ability. And if I don't have the answer for you, uh, we'll put it on to the side where we might be able to get your contact information through Kelly and we might be able to follow it up with, uh, with an answer for you, okay? So some of the misconceptions um, that are out there is that most emergencies are short-lived. Uh, I, I won't ever have to deal with an emergency where I live. There's a lot of emergencies I just can't prepare for. Preparing takes too much time, right? So when, we're, when we talk about this stuff is that if we look at emergencies now, it, it all depends. When you look at that atmospheric trough that came through the lower mainland two years ago and washed out everything into the Strait of Georgia there, um, that was a short burst of Mother Nature not liking anybody. But it took about two years after the fact to get the infrastructure back in place, right? And for everything that's in the lower mainland and Abbotsford and Chilliwack, the agricultural community there has, is still trying to recover, right? So it's no different than here where we lost our bridges close by our proximity. Um, fire, flash floods, you know, weather as in winter, which we only get a smidge of. Um, when we get lots of snow, we get blizzards, we have the potential of losing power and then being dark. Now, I don't know how many people have a secondary heating source in your home, right? The one thing that I'm working on, you know, but it, it's a little bit of coin. But if we lose power, we're going to rely on little, little portable heaters, which aren't safe, right? Because again, you're, you're, you're a combustible heating device in-house, right? You got no electricity to plug in that baseboard heat that you've got. If you have a wood stove, then you're prepared, right? You have a secondary source of heat. Um, you won't ever have to deal with it. Has everyone in this room dealt with an emergency? Show of hands. Okay. So there's some people that haven't, right? So, which is, which is very fortunate. And you know what? Knock on wood all day. Um, but you know, like the thing is, is that's why we're here, is that when we start talking about the emergencies are gonna happen. And it may not happen while you're in your house as well here. It may happen while you're on travel, you're on holidays, you're visiting some friends, and all of a sudden now you're displaced from getting back to your home, or you have to go and evacuate because you're outside the community and you couldn't get any of the stuff that you had, right? So I went to Dawson shopping, all of a sudden I got, come back and I have an evacuation area that I'm not able to enter back into. Right, so those are the kind of things that un, un, um, unpredictable. Um, there are a lot of emergencies you can't prepare for. 100% correct, right? But the thing is, is that in, as individuals, as in families, you can prepare for everything, right? Because that one emergency equals all the emergencies. That means that you can get a grab and go bag, you can have all your stuff set up, and that when you're ready to go, you're ready to go. Especially when you see columns of smoke or you get alerts saying that we're gonna have severe weather, you can back in your mind say, I'm gonna put this stuff together, I'll put it into a tote, I'll put it in the garage, because remember, if you lose power, you're not gonna open that garage door, the overhead door, it's gonna to have to be by a people door, and then you've got something that you can quickly throw into the vehicle that has all the important things that you need, right? And then <clears throat> preparing takes too much time, 100% correct as well, but, when you start small, like you are today, where you look at, I need to, I need to be self-sufficient for 72 hours, right? That's what the BC government gives you for an allotment when you come to us for the emergency um, support services, right? We give you three days, housing, food. If you're missing clothing, we'll give you a clothing allowance. And that's what you got your three days for. As well as you can check your own insurance policies because you're insurance policies may cover those things as well because then you're paying for your insurance you might as well get something back out of your insurance and then if you're not able to get to a reception center then at least you have something that you can fall back on so with those things in mind it's just a small steps to take it i've always had a grab and go bag right <laughs> I think I got a grab and go bag on the island when I was in Qualcomm Beach. And it was funny, it's like, 
you know, you stuff your underwear in there and your socks and some toothpaste. And I might have had a comb back then. I don't remember. But it was a matter of I put that thing together. I put it off the side. And then, I don't know, 10 years later, I was wondering what's in that brown duffel. And I opened it up and I'm thinking, oh, my God. A, I'm not fitting in any of this stuff anymore. Uh, that toothpaste may be questionable. And uh, I certainly don't need that comb, right? So it's just a matter of when you do put stuff together and you're prepping, um, it is just a matter of making sure that you keep it current as well. When I went through the stuff that we had with the district, you know, we had to displace most of it that we had little um, um, personal kits, you know, toothpaste, brushes, you know, um, tissues. It all dated out, so we have to make sure that everything's current. So step one is knowing the hazards. And I think this is one of the things is that this is what's identified as the top 10 hazards in, in, uh, in, the in, in the province. So we know that we don't have no tsunamis, right? But have you ever heard of an inland a tsunami? Do you guys know what that might be? Okay, so an inland tsunami is a lake, and all of a sudden the hillside gives out, pushes into the lake, creates a large wave, and then it disperses within its boundary. So it's something that's realistic, and for residents that live around the lake, it has a potential. The smaller the pond, the bigger the wave, right, depending on how much that slides. But when we're talking about earthquakes, we do have some seismic activity, but not to the magnitude of the lower mainland or any of the other faults. This is one of our biggest ones is wildfire, right? So we live within this area now where it's dry. So I had BC wildfire into the fire hall the other day, and they're talking about the depth of the duff layer, right, that is so dry it's fairly substantial. So when you guys are driving around, you see all the deadfall that's in the forest areas, and all, everything's laying down, and you wonder how any of the animals walk around. Well, that's just fuel, right? That's just, that's just pure gasoline that is going to burn itself out. And then Mother Earth has to cycle, right? It has to have these controlled burns. But now, because we've been so diligent, right, now it had, just has more force. Right now, there's just more energy, and, and for whatever, Mother Nature just doesn't appreciate us nearly as much. Um, floods, right, those are seasonal for us, right? So if everybody drives through the, the community, all, the, all, all of our fish-bearing streams are, uh, are rocks, right? But when we get into the snow uh, melt, and we get rain, and it combines, and they say that we're going to be raining for three days, and I, I'm from the lower mainland from Vancouver Island, so three days of rain, <laughs> okay, I don't understand that at all. But three days of rain here means quite a bit. Oh, when I watch the, 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 the creeks and the, and the streams rise to over their banks, that's, that, that's a, a, an issue, right? And we've been fortunate in the last few years that we haven't had an impact to the residential areas. But I'm used to 40 days of rain on the island where I had webbed toes, right? That's just the way it worked. Um, we went through a pandemic, right? We, we lived under isolation. You know, disease outbreaks are, are something that we're very fortunate. We are able to control a lot better in Canada. Severe weather, I think we've touched base with it. <clears throat> Power outages, again, what do we do? Well, how do we cope with it? And we'll talk a little bit about it as we go through some of the things we can look at. Landslides, right? Because now when we burn off the hillsides, we got all that root system that isn't supporting any of that soil anymore. We get a good blast of rain, and now we got slough, right? And some of it's fairly substantial, okay? Avalanches, that's a very unfortunate thing in the backcountry for anybody that sleds here. They have to be super conscientious of how they go in the backcountry. Because what it is is that, that frozen layers between the snow, then you get another pack on top of it, and it just doesn't merge together, and that's where you get that slide. And then everybody's out enjoying the backcountry, and they go up and do some high marking, and then the next thing you know is that they're chased by a, a, a mountain of snow, right? And hazardous material is something that is on our top list as well here in the community. And why do you think that is one of our, 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 our concerns here in the community? Pardon me? Railway. Railway. Anything else? Sorry? Trucking. Trucking. Right? 97. 97, 24 hours a day. When we, when we stopped the highway, right, for that wildfire, I can tell you nobody was happy with us. <laughs> because that 
There, there's millions and millions of dollars per hour that is getting cost to everybody. And so with us, with the rail and with, uh, with the network of transport trucks, and we have everything that you can imagine going on our streets. And on good days, they all stay on their wheels. But the fire department responding, we go to a lot of things upside down that have placards on them with stuff that you really don't want to get close to. And we've been very fortunate that most of it's being contained. The trucks are designed to roll over, crash, and, and, and not leak. And the same thing with rail, right? And with the rail here, the, the worst that's going to happen is that the, track, the train's going to come along and it's going to fall off the tracks. But it doesn't have the momentum when it's going 40 or 50 kilometers an hour when it's out into the, into the straightaways. They have to slow down when they come into town and go into the yard, and I think it's probably 10 or 15 kilometers an hour. So we're fairly lucky that we're not going to have such, something really substantial. Not to say that that doesn't happen. Anything... Everybody's pretty aware of that stuff, eh? Anybody have any questions on any of that? It's just stuff that you've got to think about. And when we put our plans together, right, um, we identify all those hazards. And now they've got a fantastic uh, website that you can spend hours on making sure that you hit all the check marks where it just says, like, I know it's going to burn. I know it's going to be a big, big bad mess. That's all I need. I need the check mark. I don't need all the other obviouses, right? So why do you think the, the, the reason that uh, Kelly's asked you to have this as in your packages is that this is a resource for you to have that you can leave in your car, right? Or in your grab and go bag. Because if you forget something at home, we're not letting you back in to go get your license or your, your purse or, your, or any of that stuff um, because it might be too dangerous. So at least here, if you have this thing filled out with all the information that is in there, at least you have a point where you can go talk to someone and you can get the stuff that you need. Yes? Uh, what about if you're during emergency, you're at work, and you just have to go back and you're now out, but you have pets at home? Okay. Like, what happens? So... When, when those scenarios start to play out where you're at work and there's family and there's pets and stuff like that, then when we'll make arrangements to take you into your premise to go get what you need to get, right? If there's animals that need to be retrieved, then 100%. And there's a slide that, that illustrates that when we go through, hey? Okay? children? Sorry? Four children? Children. Yeah, you can go get your children. <laughs> Generally, when we knock on the door and they're about this big and, and then they say, uh, yeah, mom and dad aren't home, then they usually go for a ride with uh, whoever's knocking on the door. So another thing that we've lost as a skill set is remembering phone numbers, right? I don't even bother trying to remember my missus' phone number because it's right on the phone, right? And then when she tells me it, and it still hasn't clicked. And we, We've had the same number for a long, long time. I remember my number because I have to give it out all the time. But when you know, what are you going to do when you have to vacate? Um, you want to make sure that you have a list of people that you can call for help, right? So if you have animals, so if we have pets, um, chickens, rabbits, horses, cattle, then that becomes a little bit more escalated. But within that mindset, if you have horses, then you are within a network of people that have horse trailers, right? And I can guarantee you 100% that everybody's going to come to your aid because they don't want to see the animals get hurt. Um, one co contact should be live far away. So if you've got someone outside the region that you can say, I'm safe. So I have to leave. I've got to go. Um, and then I stop wherever they send me. I say, hey, dad, mom, uh, uncle cousin, brother, whatever. I'm in Dawson Creek right now. I'm safe. I'm clear. Everything's good. I'll keep you updated, right? So you have one person because then that one person can network outside the rest of the family, right? So you don't have to phone everybody. I only have to phone one person. Hey, let everybody know I'm safe, okay? And they'll do that for you. Uh, one contact should live nearby. Well, I want a neighbor to come and help me. I need you to help me lift my ATV in the back of the truck, right? Because I'm taking all my toys because I'm the guy that's at home, right? Pictures and that, but don't need any of it. So how are you going to communicate and how are you going to get that message through? Um, the next big thing is that once you're asked to leave or there's an emergency coming, where do you want to <coughs> find the information? And so 
always start with the local sources. So we have uh, media here tonight. Um, they are a key resource. Um, our radio station, our district office, our website, our Facebook, our, our social media. The PRD is another network because the, um, that's their fire. So they declared the local state of emergency. And so they have a banner on their web page that runs with all the alerts and, and evacuation orders. And they're doing, they do this on a very regular basis. They have it dialed in so that you can click on it, you see a map, and you can see what's going on. And one of the things to keep in mind is that everybody wants instantaneous information, right? We live with this phone, right? And I should have it because all we do is swipe. We swipe all day, right? We, did you have something? Well, you're mentioning all of this, again, going back to um, being able to get that information in an area that has cell service and internet service. What about places that don't have that? So when we're, we're, we're identifying those areas, and so again, that's going to be back to, if we're asking you to leave, then it always going to be one-on-one, -on -one, right? There's always going to be someone knocking on your door. We're not going to leave it to social media to tell you to leave, right? Social media is only giving you the information after you have left your home, right? Or it's going to give you the information letting you know that this is coming and you need to prepare, right? That's what an evacuation alert is. An alert is telling you that within the next 12 to 24 hours, there's a potential for immediate um, danger to you and your property. So that means that, okay, I don't have to go. I should be looking over my shoulder to see where that column of smoke is. And then I should be gathering what is important into a tote uh, and getting ready to load up the car, right? What happens is that an alert is, is like a fire alarm, right? When that fire alarm goes off in a building, we probably get maybe 30% compliance. The other 70% think, eh, it's just a false alarm. But that one time that that occurs, they're going to be caught in a fire. The reason that we've designed fire alarm systems now that it's so loud is that we're driving people out. We have a, we have a, like a flashing light on the wall now that kind of like puts you into a seizure. We got you deafening out the door because you have to find re refuge somewhere where it's quiet. So when we give you the alert, that means that you have to be prepared. An uh, order... Um, to leave means that you got to go now and it gives you probably enough time to collect the things that you need to do and you have to do it in a timely fashion. If you see the fire in your backyard, that means that you've got to go and you got to go now, right? So those are the, there's, there's always different scenarios that you have to work through, right? Um, website, social media, uh, through phone numbers, uh, radio stations, those are some of the places that... What, what is the best website or place to get your first information? Because I got the notice saying, get ready to evacuate. And I went on looking, trying to find how, where is the fire, how is it, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I couldn't find hardly anything. Yeah. My tenant works for the mine. He's updated through the mine on his phone all the time. So he was able to tell me what was going on. I couldn't find it anywhere. Yeah. And where is the best place to look? It's so, so we'll try... And I wish I could say what is the best. So you got to remember that this fire started about four o'clock, four o'clock in the afternoon. It crept up the hill. We set up command, and then we started asking people to leave, leave their houses about quarter after five. So we have an hour and fifteen minutes. So hour and fifteen minutes is not very much time to facilitate getting everything online. Everything that they're doing in the regional district, because that's their area, has to go through their board, and someone has to sign their name, and then someone has to put it on the website. There's a delay, right? And there's nothing we can do about that stuff. So some of the places that we look at is the, um, online with the Emergency Info BC. Um, but locally here, we have, um, the, we have our website needs to be updated because we've identified some of the issues, exactly what you said, sir, as far as I looked and there was nothing. When I went after the fact, I looked, I saw, and I thought, oh man, we gotta do something quick here. But where we relied the majority of our time was, was on Facebook, right? 
Facebook is, seems to be the, the, the outlet for everybody following. So you've got uh, the concerned citizens of Chetwin. I can use that because we have the media here. Um, and so they're pretty diligent on keeping stuff up. Uh, but the district and the regional district um, and the regional district website, so their website is a lot better than ours right now, but it, it has a banner, like I said. So it'll give you the information as quickly as possible as they can process it. Um, the district now has a new app, this BCITI Plus. And so it's another app that you can get on your phone. So then the uh, district will be able to update the information um, via that. So we're looking at different venues. So the guys at the mine and everything, that's an internal network, right? And you gotta remember is that the only accurate information is coming from local government or it's coming from BC Wildfire. So everybody has that BC Wildfire app, right? I think everybody's got it because it's just really curious to see how many red dots can cover a map in a season, right? Um, but for locally, here is, is kind of like that's where you go to. Okay. So some of the considerations as we make our plan. This, I, I inserted this slide because I think this is probably the most critical component that you guys can start with right now. How many people have a full tank of gas in their car? I always have to always probably just because you filled up your stream in the town, that's cool. But for me, I know that uh, one of the biggest problems is that this is a photo of the Fort Mac evacuation several years ago. 80,000 people were asked to go in a timely fashion. That meant go now. Chaos is only added to when there's no fuel in your tank. So you gotta think about how far do I need to get with my vehicle? Now everybody thinks, well, I only gotta go an hour to Dawson, or I gotta go an hour to Tumblr, or to Hudson Hope. Well, sometimes that's not gonna be an option. You may have to go to Prince George. Now, Prince George, Mackenzie Junction, we could ask them to open, we probably will, Right, but if it doesn't happen, or you're at E, e you have to go fill up. So an example of this is that when Fort St. John was put on alert last year, they had a run on the gas stations, right? Hours, miles, blocks, no fuel in the, ta in the, in the big tanks, right? Because everybody panicked. Everybody panicked because they remember this scenario of, of, of stranded cars on the side of the road. This is probably one of the most critical things they can. You leave it at three quarters at least. At least you know you can get a mile or two away from where the emergency, so. Um, that makes sense? Okay. So another thing is that when you fill out your, um, your emergency plans, um, care card numbers, family doctors, <laughs> if we have one, uh, <laughs> medications, medical equipment, and other important information. So if you, we, in our community, we have a lot of people that are reliant on others, right? They're bedridden. Um, so those are, those are gonna be challenges for us to help them as far as planning and making sure we, they're on top of our list to get people to help them. These items are when you forget your purse, you forget your wallet. I saw guys like leaving in their bare feet, right? Because it's time to go. And those are the type of things that, like if you have um, a CPAP machine, right, that helps you sleep, you know, those are the type of things that you know what you have to get when you're in the host community as you move forward, right? So care card number is really important. Like that's going to be part of your, your um, plan. So another couple of things to consider is that, um, you know, around your home. So we, have, we do a lot of public ed to, for schools and we teach the kids of how to get out of your house, right? And uh, we teach the kids, you know, like you have to have two ways out. You know, if you live up on second floor, you should have a little ladder and all this kind of stuff. Just don't jump out and think that fire guy is going to save you things. You're going to probably just, ah. But the big thing here is that for yourselves is that understanding that, um, that you have to have a plan because even if you do or something happens that we don't even have a chance to get to you, that you need to know. And sometimes it's going to be in the middle of the night, 1.30 in the morning, and I hear crackling, I smell something, and I look out the window and I see a big orange ball of unhappiness, right? So exits, windows, 
uh, utilities, um, landlord, if you're a renter, shuts the stuff off, how to shut your utilities off safely. So one of the big things is, is that we, if we don't shut some of our utilities off, then that adds to the hazards, right? So natural gas, everybody's got uh, natural gas for the better part, and if not natural gas, they have a propane tank that is, you know, an arm's reach away from the house. And um, if, if these things are compromised and we have enough structure fires is that this is the flow of gas when the lever's like that. When it turns, there's a quarter turn valve. And you can turn that off because now the meter, if the house is affected with anything, then it's a matter of it's going to be secured, right? If something happens inside the house, right, there's no gas, right? What happens when there's an accumulation of gas in the house? It turns everything into toothpicks, right? Especially if there's an ignition source. Um, and the good thing about this is that Fortis is going to come and turn that back on for you and relight all your appliances, right? That's the schedule. Don't take it upon yourself. And then so that's, that's your gas meters. Um, electrical panel, right? Again, um, locate the main breaker, uh, flip it off. Uh, this will shut power off to the home. One of the things is, is that um, if, well, I guess, let me make sure I got this right. When you leave the power on and the power goes out, like, like it did the main transmission lines, people still are able to back feed their homes with generators, right? And if this individual doesn't shut his breaker off and have it plugged in below here, then it has the potential to back feed, right? And back feeds all everything else. And so with that in mind, it becomes a hazard. So if you do have exposed wires, linemen, they really like that because when they think that something's de-energized and they make all the little hairs stand up on them, uh, yeah, it doesn't work very well, right? So it's just a matter of another precaution. Um, your water, okay? So again, our water is probably copper and then it turns into all that nice plastic stuff. And so all that does is that if something happens inside your home and something fractures or it freezes, right? If we're leaving in the middle of winter and we don't shut it off at that point, um, the rest of the house, if you don't drain it, might have the potential of busting the lines because you're not circulating or keeping the house warm, right? So. so again, generally when we ask you guys to leave, you guys are going to leave in an orderly fashion and we're going to give you a point of destination the Chetwin District Office was a ESS reception center where you register. And we want, even if you don't want um, help and you're going to be self-sufficient, we still want you to stop and register. So it's a matter, hi, I'm Dan, I'm, I'm here, I've got a place, i got my RV, I'm going to go find a campsite, I'm good to go. Okay, Dan, I'm going to make a note that Dan signed in here. So Dan's, what was your address? Well, I, I'm here, AYB, uh, Sesame Street, and I'm, I'm good to go. Right. That way, when we get calls and saying, hey, I'm looking for Dan, uh, you know, uh, from Sesame Street. And they can say, yeah, we have him. He's at the RV park and that's where you can get hold of him. Right. So it's important if you have nothing and you need help, we are there. We're going to give you 72 hours worth of help. Right. Depending on the, the situation and the circumstances. So if you forget something, if you forget a jacket, you forget your pants, you forget something else. We'll make sure that we give you an allotment to go to the local uh, store to get it so that you're going to be comfortable while you're displaced. OK, so this is talking about close in your proximity, um, meeting outside of your neighborhood um, for school age kids. Um, how many people have kids that are in school here? couple, right? So big thing there is to know what they're going to do. So we're working closely with the school board, uh, which is great now because now I understand how they're going to do it because when I call the school board, I'm going to say, hey, you need to do this because this is coming. And they're going to say, Dan, no big deal. I'm going to do this because we have it planned. So it's a matter of ensuring that you, the parents know that they're going to load them up on bus. They're going to take it to point A. Uh, and if point A is no good, then we're going to take it to B, and that's where you can pick up your children, right? And so that's just something you have to check with the school boards, okay? Um, and again, it's the school board or, or the school that the child's in, their contact information and stuff like that. Is that I participated with the South Peace School Board. Um, they do have uh, an extensive emergency plan, and that plan 
uh, overlays all the schools. And perhaps the principal or the secretary in which you were talking to wasn't quite comfortable where that was without talking to someone a little bit further up the, the ladder. So, but I know that I was part of their review and it's, it, it's, it's good. Because we, we talk about a lot of different things with the school stuff, right? Because it's not just the fires and the floods, there's some internal stuff that's interesting with it too, so, okay. Good? Okay, so planning for pets. So when, when we're at the district office and we have an evacuation and we bring people in or we deal with our own people, there's a ton of online stuff saying, hey, I got a pasture for your horses. I got, I, I got places for your dogs because some places don't take large dogs um, or you have a, an aggressive dog and you, may, and you don't have friends. There's still people out there that's gonna help you. Um, Big thing here is try to find beforehand where you might be able to take the animals. So if you got horses on a five acre piece, where you can take it, because most of you all have networks where other people are outside the harm's way, can, can house your horse. Um, <clears throat> and then pack a grab and go bag for your, your, your pet, because the big thing there is that, how many people are remembering to take the dog food when you're putting the dog in the car? Right? It's like, okay, get in the damn car, right? We're going, right? And then, okay, I'm gonna go get some dog food. But if you prepare for it and you got enough food, because the dog doesn't eat a lot, and you don't need to take their tub with them. You just need to take three days worth of food because you got water wherever you're gonna be, right? A, a food dish and a water dish and away you go. Um, <clears throat> and then if you have any, if your pets have ailments or you know your vet contact information because the animals might be distressed or they may get injured, whatever the case may be, at least you have a point of contact when you have to take them to get some people to look at it, right? So anything about that? Does that help you? Especially if you're at work, you, we'll make sure you get your animals, okay? Uh, I, I do our best at least. Um, additional planning. Right, so these are some of the other things to keep in mind when you're going to be talking about putting your grab and go bag together. You know, like extra supply of prescriptions. I know that we like, we're lacking doctors and we don't have a surplus of any of that stuff. But another thing is just make sure that you're topped up, not with a couple of days left without getting your prescription refilled. Manual backup for wheelchairs, right? We have a lot of motorized vehicles, like even those little small scooters. We've got to have some kind of just conventional means to move um, people with. <coughs> uh, service animal, animals uh, in your preparation. So there are people with service animals, and everybody understands what a service animal is for, for people, is that that animal is there to serve the person because it has an injury or a, dis a disability or, or something that the dog's able to detect. And that dog is strictly for that individual. And so for us to go and do anything with that dog, we gotta make sure that it's with the person that it belongs to. So you have to bring that person all together. And so you need to make sure that if you know people that have that uh, utility dog, that they have a little grab and go kit for that dog as well, so it can accompany it. Uh, I need to get hearing aids, so I'll, that'll probably be in my bag when I get them. Uh, extra batteries and pen and uh, writing pad for Verbal communication is difficult. So, example of that, the other day we have alarms, knock, 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 no, no one's answering. You can smell something that, you know, not what it's supposed to be. Uh, PR opens the door, go in, clap, clap, loud, loud, clap, clap, loud, loud. Buddy's just sitting there and I'm almost, I'm almost right here. And then I really scared him, right? Because I'm a stranger, danger, right? Why am I in this place? And then he wasn't very happy with it. But again, that's the thing is that I had almost to write down why I was there saying, hey, I'm Dan, I could smell something, you know, is everything okay, right? We got to evacuate. We need to go now because there's a lot of people and I'm, unfortunately I'm getting to that person where I'm not hearing or maybe it's selective, who knows? Um, but there are people that have difficulty hearing, right? So just one of those things to help aid with things. These emergency kits can be either a duffel bag or, or a hard case, right? Something that's easy to put in the back of the vehicle because you've got the dog, the cat, the kids, whatever else you're going to be putting in there. And you want to make sure that you're at least somewhat sufficient for at least three days. Sometimes you don't have that opportunity. Sometimes there's a, a, a house fire and everything's gone with that house fire and you have nothing. Uh, this is when you actually have the time to prepare and then move with it. And then um, two weeks worth of supplies to keep everyone comfortable 
till service resume. You can't stuff two weeks into a tote for an emergency. We expect 72 hours that you're self-sufficient. And then remember, after that 72 hours, then you have your insurance that should be able to kick in. Something you should check when you go back to check with your insurance carrier on your home to see what you have for those type of scenarios. And you might be surprised because that's one of the things that came to my attention is that you guys can get this stuff for your insurance. But the insurance doesn't share that, hey, you know what, if you're displaced, we'll give you all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And they're thinking, well, you know, I've been paying for 20 years, so I want to get something out of it, right? Um, so anyways, a couple of things to keep in, in mind. We already went over kind of the hazards. So some of the things that we need to look at, right? So some basic emergency supply kits. Um, this is probably one of the things that, you know, you may have to look at to purchase is one of those hand crank radios, right? Um, but we've got, uh, you know, battery powered uh, flashlights or hand crank flashlights, a whistle. Why do you think a whistle is relevant? Oh, can't speak. Pardon me? You can't speak. Yeah. You still. You can't speak, you still can breathe. <laughs> right? And it, what it does is just if, you, if you're compromised or you're immobilized, at least someone will be able to hear that and come to your, to your assistance. Well, that's a great answer. Um, so your first aid kits, prescriptions, and your personal items. Um, obviously, the phone charger is huge. Non-perishable uh, foods, right? How many people have enough food in their house to survive seven days? <laughs> we live in a. Uh, <laughs> you know, I go and open. Uh, uh, me and my missus, we're, we're, uh, she's still in Fort St. John working and comes on the weekend, but I'm a, basically a bachelor during the week while I'm here, right? And I go in that cab, uh, the cupboards, and I wonder, hmm, there's not a hope in heck, right? Because everything in there is, hasn't been eaten for a reason, right? So, um, but no, I mean, that's a, it's an important thing to keep in mind is that find stuff that you're going to enjoy and it's easy to cook, right? You got those little burners now that you can set up with a little pot. You can do soups and, and stuff like that. Um, garbage bags, moist toilets, um, you know, so that you can keep yourself um, clean so that you're just happy, right? Um, and uh, blankets or seasonal clothes because like we change modes when it's winter we have a blanket in the car we have heavy clothes right uh, I'm not driving around in shorts right uh, well better part I am but um, when it gets 30 below then I change my philosophy altogether how I dress right um, so and water again for um, for the three days to two weeks and then actually having those little straws right, where you can actually filter your water, right, and that's worst case scenario. The big thing is, is that you know what makes you comfortable, you know what's important to you, those are the things that you want with you. If you know, like if you're, if you read a lot, you like novels, always make sure that you've got a brand new book that you haven't read before, because at least that's one thing that you can put in there and keep yourself occupied. If you do word games, scrambles, all that kind of stuff, something to occupy your time and your mind because it's a stressful situation. And I can guarantee you that there's nothing that we can do to relieve that from it. And you're going to have to be patient. And the only way you're going to be patient is trying to be comfortable, right? So find something that you're going to be able to do because the more you play on your phone, the more it's going to go dead, right? And depending if you don't have a vehicle where you can go charge, it in, um, you may be just stuck in a room like this, just unfortunate circumstances. Um, grab and go bags, right? Like they're just smaller, right? So that when, when you travel is probably a good example of what you want to take, right? Because how many people have traveled and all of a sudden you arrive at your destination and you don't have luggage, right? And then you're thinking, oh, okay, next time you, you certainly do have a change of something in that, uh, that grab and go bag, right? So that you're comfortable until the airlines give you some, a voucher for very little money to go find somewhere in a foreign country to go and buy things that you don't know what it is, right? So um, just a matter of ensuring yourself that those grab and go bags are comfort items. Um, so a couple of things here, we're talking about pen and pad, uh, charger, the flashlight, a little first aid kit, the whistle, the batteries, water, socks, yeah. underwear, right? Um, anything that you may need to, to utilize, right? So, but 
again, <clears throat> it's a preference. When I packed my first grab and go bag when I was a lot younger and a lot more naive, I had sweats, I had t-shirts, I had everything that I was never ever gonna wear, right? Because it just what it was what it was, right? I, uh, whatever I'm in now, probably, because the emergency happens now, uh, the next 24 hours is gonna be me in this and now, and uh, I, I think I'm probably into this for 72 hours. So um, there's no much relief for myself. But for you guys, it's a matter of making sure that you've got something that you're comfortable with and that you have something that uh, you're able to get at easily, okay? So again, to highlight our three steps in my 45 minutes, um, know your hazards, make your plan, and gather your supplies, right? Because that's one of the biggest things that we can ask you to do um, as we prepare for moving forward, okay? So some of the other things, there's lots of literature online, and everybody's well-versed with working the internet. Uh, Prepared BC has a um, Facebook uh, link that you guys can um, subscribe to. So it comes up with little stuff all the time, little tidbits that gives you like um, the information that you may be looking for. Um, X is the, um, used to be the Twitter, Twitter, whatever it is. Uh, that just shows you how good I am with that. Uh, <laughs> Facebook and Instagram. Um, and then you can download these guides. And again, there's so much information out there. And just pick the stuff that's going to work for you. You don't need to go and uh, uh, overload yourself. Keep it simple. Make it comfortable. And then just be prepared to go. Okay? So, any questions? This is the, this is the new site for the district is using to try to have more interaction. So Q&A notices, um, and then I'm gonna leave my number and my email there so that you guys can get hold of me at your convenience if you have any other questions further down the line. And that, that app is only for within district boundaries, correct? That's right, yeah. So your regional district? The you regional already... district has, let me have a look. I was gonna pull that up. Um, see, my eyes are that good. Uh, it's ever bright, I believe. Ever bright. And so, again, that's another subscription. Um, Everbridge. Everbridge, yep, there it is. Everbridge. Yeah, so probably not a good conversation. <laughs> okay, so just remember that um, one of the biggest things that you can help responders and, um, and the communities that are hosting you if you're asked to go to a different community is be patient. And I know that's probably the hardest thing to ask you to do because everybody wants to know what, what's happening, how's my house, what's the status. When can I go home? So one of the things to keep in mind is that my priority as the emergency coordinator and the fire chief here is that I return you to your place of dwelling as soon as I can, right? I don't need you to leave the community when there's a fire burning 30 kilometers away. I need you to be comfortable. I need you to be ready that when it happens like the other day where it's two kilometers from your house, that you're prepared to go, right? And then as soon as we're able to mitigate that danger, that we're able to get you back. Because that was one of the biggest bonuses that we had that day is that we were able to return you home in a timely fashion. And why do you think that's important for me, for you to know that? Is that if I displace you for eight days for no reason, where do you think you're gonna go the next time I ask you to leave? <coughs> nobody's leaving and it's statistical when I evacuated Tumblr the first time I had 90% compliance okay everyone to leave we're gonna burn down ah, right mother nature didn't come and touch the community which didn't help me because that you need to have something to show people that there was a danger they can drive through nine kilometers worth of fire to get back to the community but it didn't touch their house so Tumblr evacuates on a regular basis now because it's just the nature. Every time they start losing that percentage. 
So last time we were in there, when we were doing our, we went in as the Chetwin Fire Department, when we were doing the drive about, we were experiencing probably 40% in the community, right? So what do you think that 40% does to the evacuation or due to responding to a wildfire if that thing does come into the community? Hinders, right? Because as much as you're grown adults, right, that you're able to stay there, right, um, wh where, where are we going first? We're going to you. We're going to you because I know you're there, and i got to make sure you're not there, and you need to get around the red truck, and I need to lose focus on where I can save the community. So it's really important that when we ask you to leave, that you leave, and I will do my best within the conditions that are burning to get you home as quickly as possible because I still need that 100% all the time, right? So, because when I go to apartment fire, uh, apartment alarms, I see a guy still cooking his barbecue. I see another guy having a smoke out in his bal balcony waiting to see if I'm gonna show up. And then I go in and, you know, knock, 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 right? That one day that there's fire, and those people can't get out, then we're going to be putting people in jeopardy to go and rescue them, right? And when you're on the fourth floor, it's a bit of a go. So, but anyways, that's basically what I got. And I apologize to uh, Kelly that I took a little bit longer than 45 minutes, but I just enjoy talking in front of people, as you can tell. And um, you guys are being really wonderful. So do you have any questions for me? You know, to be quite honest with you, um, uh, according to the federal government and, and the law, is that you, over the age of 18, do not have to evacuate, okay? Any child that's under the age of 18 that is uh, um, not leaving, then they have to be evacuated, right? Um, if someone has a, a disability um, that with a mental issues, then we're able to help them move forward. But if you choose to stay in your home and then all of a sudden something hits, it's the exact same thing I said to you is that we're more than likely going to come and help you, right? Because I know, I make a mental note where people are because that's our job. So when this evacuation, we saw yellow tape on people's uh, driveways. So we have a color code that we're going to be implementing. So it says that I talk to you, you're leaving, color code appropriate. I talked to you guys, you decided you leave, you're gonna stay, you're gonna fight the fire, a different code. So then when we're driving by, I can see that you left, you left, you stayed, you left, you left, and then I come back to find you later um, to say, you know, is, is, it, is it good to go now? You know, <laughs> and you'll be saying, oh, well, maybe, you know. Um, but anyways, that, there's a color code that we'll be able to see visually that we'll be able to do it because everything is a trial and error. Right, and um, I knew that I needed to tag the houses that we talked to. And um, for the better part, my people that were on the ground said to me that everybody was met with cordial, they were uh, receptive, and they were going to go. So we didn't have too many people sticking back. Because the problem there is that if you have um, a neighborhood watch and you all know one another, it's a completely different scenario if someone stays behind. If you live in a community and someone stays behind, like the Donny Creek fire, right? Um, <coughs> it was close to 650,000 hectares, um, all with a 400 kilometer fire front, right? A lot of people were asked to leave. But the problem is, is that if you imagine Presbyterian, um, Buick, all that area there, you can't secure it. So then you have the looky loose. Yeah, the people that are not on the same, you know, evacuation notice as you are. And that's one of the things that we tried to mitigate. That's why we kept that highway closed, is that we couldn't secure that area. Well, as long as the fire was there too, so, you know. But I can, I can tell you that that was one of the forefronts, is that if we secure this chunk of property, then we know that it's going to be secure. Right, because again, your property is just as important as you moving out. We don't need a bunch of other people going in and borrowing stuff, right? So. Mm -hmm.